Because also in MRI there's a high pressure now to, to go to higher fields. I mean, 10 years ago nobody thought that there was a demand for uh, MRI machines operating above two Tesla. The, 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 the hospitals were filled up with one and a half Tesla machines. And everybody thought, well, that is it. Above this there's no interesting medicine to do. Maybe interesting physics, but not interesting medicine. And now all the doctors that are doing uh, high-tech uh, research and, and state-of-the-art medicine uh, in radiology, they demand uh, three Tesla or even seven and eight Tesla systems. And not for mice, but really for men. So that these are big systems. Large like this, this is the largest one we've done. This, this actually is um, about to be shipped now. And it's actually a 9.4 Tesla, 900 millimeters of bore, uh, whole body engine magnet. And um, the thing I wanted to point out was that the cooling on this magnet is actually on on the top of these tall chimneys, you see the chimneys here, and right at the very top, there are two of them, um, are two uh, 10k GM coolers. And as I say, this is cryogenically, this is an early design, but actually, in truth, there's no other way of doing it uh, for something of this size, because as I say, the central field, 9.4 Tesla, and as we've heard, these cryo coolers aren't very happy stray fields of more than a few hundred gas. So in order to get the cryo cooler far enough away from the magnetic field, we have to put it on a large net. I find amazing actually is that we've got the cooler sitting about a yard above the cryostat, and yet the shield that's connected to that cryo cooler, the outer shield sits at about 70k. And the inner shield, um, which is obviously protected by the outer shield, sits at about maybe 14, 15, 16k. So Having these remote coolers, uh, we can still get our shields down to temperatures where the radiation is reduced to a very low level. I have to confess, having heard concerns about liquid helium, this magnet took 20,000 litres of helium to cool down. Um, it turns out that even though this is an absolutely monstrous magnet weighing about 45 tonnes, it uses less than 100 cc's of helium per hour. This one also is not a, um, an actually shielded magnet, so it goes inside an even bigger sh shield. This one goes inside an 870 ton <laughs> shield on the side. But if you look at the top of the picture, you'll see up there all the light bulbs above the magnet fail because the sort of light bulbs we have in our factory don't like magnetic fields. A very important factor in NMR and MRI is the signal to noise ratio S over N. We find this is proportional to the field strength B raised to the power 1.75. But let's suppose we couldn't change the strength of our field, say we had a given uh, magnet. Then uh, what we could do instead to increase the signal to noise is increase the length of the experiment or the number of scans that we need, little n, which is raised to the power of 0.5. So clearly it's much more effective to increase the field strength than to increase the number of scans. Magnetization is also dependent on the magnetic field. That's why higher fields will produce larger signal. It's quite clear that either you can increase the signal by increasing magnetization or by increasing frequency, which means increasing field. There are two ways to, to do it, or both if it's possible. As far as noise is concerned, I mean, this is thermal noise, square root of uh, KTR. You have both resistance and temperature, both comp components. Now, as far as the body, you cannot lower the temperature of the body for obvious reasons, because a uh, patient will not, uh, will not agree. As far as the coils, you can reduce this part by either reducing temperature or reducing resistance or both. And that's what happens when you cool down even copper or you use you your superconductors. If you can cool your pickup coil to a low temperature, then you can gain a lot on noise from, uh, from the pickup coil. <coughs> now, originally, these coil probes were developed in response to the idea of trying to use high temperature superconductors for pickup coils. But actually, it turns out that in today's state of the art, cold copper is really just about as good as high TC, and it's a lot easier to, to manufacture coils from, from copper. But the way this is done is actually quite interesting. What we do is we deliver cold um, down through a long transfer arm to a probe that's up inside the center of the NMR magnet. And so the way that's achieved is we actually take a parasitic flow from the return stream to the compressor. 
it's a high pressure side. This flow then goes down through, through into the probe, where it's used to cool the pre out you know, for reasons that aren't, aren't clear, and then through to cool the RF coils themselves, and then it goes back through the heat exchangers, um, back through a purifying system, and then back into the cold head. So, you know, the whole thing uses the compressor from the cold head, there's no additional compressor. And these things have to run for typically a year or more, so purity of the gas is absolutely vital. Gain, which we have by using superconducting coils instead of copper coils, will increase with decreasing size of the coil. The problem is that when, when we are increasing frequency, the body noise increases very fast, but the coil noise increases much, much slower. So what we have to do, we have to, to decrease the size of the coil, to put again the system in coil noise dominated regime. Smaller element, higher signal to noise ratio is. And when you have an array, in that case, array that is a combination of high signal to noise ratio of a single element which combines both, both features. More channels, faster imaging, and that makes sense to, to start to use arrays. But the fact that you have small coil, it means that the noise is mainly in the coil, not in the body. Challenges. Why? Because all coils have to work kind of separately, not to electromagnetically, not to see each other. So a single coil shouldn't see any of other coils. So they are working independently and that's how those images are acquired. At the same time, for, for superconductors, that is a challenge, te both technological and, and, and technical challenge. There is an interesting alternative concept of using superconducting receive coils for MRI system that requires only a very weak constant magnetic field of the order of tens of millitesla, which can be easily generated by even non-superconducting magnets. Despite of a uh, very significant increase of, of uh, signal-to-noise ratio due to the using superconducting coil at very low field, uh, we have to realize that what, what we are doing here we are increasing very significantly, but still very small signal. And it will never be as high signal as we can get at, at higher fields. At the extreme end of the low field MRI is a squid base MRI which exploits the longitudinal spin lattice relaxation time, so called T1. Longitudinal relaxation causes recovery of the magnetization component when a transverse spin spin relaxation, so called T2, causes shortening of magnetization component. At very low fields or low Larmor frequencies, T1 dominates and can be used for MRI imaging. However, as we will see, the quality of ultra-low field MRI images are not as good as conventional high magnetic field MRI images. Well, first of all, compared with conventional MRI, I think you could build this system for a substantially lower cost. Certainly you could build a more open system. And this is appealing because it ultimately offers the possibility that you could do surgery while you're also doing the magnetic resonance imaging. At least for small parts of the body, we have comparable spatial resolution uh, with high field MRI. We have greatly improved T1 contrast imaging. And this is the focus of our attention right now and the possibility of using this uh, for tumor screening and tumor imaging. I've tried to show that we could hope to image uh, parts of the body in the presence of not only biopsy needles, but also metal implants. For example, if you have screws in your knee, we've been able to take uh, images of slices of, of the forearm and these might take typically a minute to get a, a slice which is considerably slower than it would take in high field and I think that's just a fact of life that will always be slower than high field. First of all I think that our coil is what will be called a surface coil in MRI and depending on what you're imaging you may just have a surface coil and you can place that over the region you're hoping to image. Um, in the case of looking at the head, then they use what's called a birdcage coil, and they wrap this whole coil around the head. So I think that one of the issues with this squid-based MRI is that it would be, I think, difficult to make a system that would look at the whole body. 
And it's just because you would need to make many different kinds of coils, which means many different kinds of, of cryostat. Having said that, um, there are already in existence systems that I think could be used for MRI as well. And I don't know if you're familiar with magnetoencephalography, but this is a system where you have 300 squids looking at the head. And I think it would be very natural to combine that MEG system with MRI. And in fact, there are preliminary results from the PTV in Berlin where they've actually done this. Another uh, possibility is um, systems to look at the heart, cardiography. And I think it would be very natural to piggyback the MRI on the existing array of squids. It's obviously important that the background field be reasonably stable. And it turns out that our lab is next to a large elevator, a large lift. And when we first started to take images, if the lift moved, then the field would change by about 1%, which was a big problem. But we fixed that by realizing that the, um, if we orient the Larmor field, the NMR field, perpendicular to the direction of the field from the elevator, it's only a second order effect. Some scientists even want to go further and replace superconducting coils by nano-size hole sensors in NMR systems. I believe that the, the NMR nuclear magnetic resonance or uh, spin resonance regime will be accessible with uh, hole detection and this will create some kind of a new generation of tools 